Hello, and welcome to China Forum, the leading program for discussing the latest in trends and developments on China's politics, economics, culture, and society. My name is Emily O'Brien, and I'll be your program moderator for today. On this episode of China Forum, we'll be discussing an important topic for China, both domestically and internationally, the internet. We are happy to welcome our expert today, Dr. Scott Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy is the Deputy Director of the Freeman Chair in China Studies, as well as the Director of the Project on Chinese Business and Political Economy at CSIS. He is a leading authority on China's economic policy and its global economic relations, focusing on industrial policy, business lobbying, multinational business challenges in China, Chinese participation in global economic regimes, and philanthropy. Dr. Kennedy has traveled to China many times and has conducted thousands of interviews with Chinese officials, businesses, lawyers, nonprofit organizations, and scholars. He is also the author of The Business of Lobbying in China, as well as the editor of three other books on China. Dr. Kennedy, thank you for joining us today. Mm, happy to be here. So political censorship is built into all layers of China's internet infrastructure. One method, which we often call the Great Firewall of China, primarily targets the mov movement of information between the global internet and China. Other methods include blocking specific information on Chinese websites and monitoring the internet access of individuals. So in a way, um, all these methods of censorship plus China's unique websites and social media platforms have really combined to give China a unique national internet. Um, how would you say that that's affected China and its people? Well, I think from a, a long-term perspective, we need to see that the internet uh, even with all of the controls and the Great Firewall, has made Chinese open to a lot more knowledge and information than they had before. Mm -hmm. Certainly when China first opened its doors to the West in the late 70s and early 80s, you began to see books from the West sent to China, published, translated. Uh, scholars and universities and students would read these. But it was a very small trickle. I mean, important works, but still very small. The Internet has really democratized the flow of information internationally into China. Uh, yet at the same time, as, as everybody knows, uh, the Chinese uh, government and the Communist Party are uh, very uh, serious about controlling information. It's one of the foundations of the party. Mm -hmm. and, and so they've taken a lot of steps. Um, and so what uh, to control content, to uh, eliminate content, to shape opinion, uh, to surveil, uh, to collect information uh, from users of the Internet. Um, and what that does lead to is that China's uh, Internet user has a relatively distinctive experience from people in, in other parts of the world where the Internet isn't controlled in the, in the same way. Um, but it, it is a game of, of cat and mouse. It is, the Chinese are trying, uh, and in many ways successful, uh, controlling the internet, but it is an ongoing dynamic process uh, in which uh, there is both trends towards control and access to new information and ideas that didn't originate with the Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, that they didn't block. Uh, and so that leaves us in a situation that isn't just simply once you go inside the firewall, you're totally blocked off from the rest of the world, uh, but one in, in which uh, people are grappling with being in that situation, but also trying to put their own spin on things as well. So as you say, there is some information available inside the firewall. It's you know, not a completely different landscape. Um, the Chinese government maintains that it does have the right to control this internet, know that, that it's a sovereign internet. Do you think that this, this concept of controlling a country's internet um, is a legitimate one? And um, if not, do you think, how long do you think the government can really sustain that? Sure. Well, this. Um, idea of um, internet sovereignty which the Chinese have raised and promoted in some ways is based on some common norms. Generally, I mean the internet itself is part of telecommunication networks mm -hmm. and every country's government manages their telecom networks. They basically manage the licensing of access to the frequencies um, and the building of those networks. Uh, and so even the United States, you know, controls the licensing. Some of it is for military use, most of it's for commercial use, and then individual broadcasters and others need to get access to that space. And the U.S. has various rules for broadcasters ab about, you know, uh, pornography or bad language that we keep off. But so, so there is 
you know, regulation. It's not a total free market. Um, but China's gone one step further because they actually want to um, constructively, proactively eliminate a lot of content which is available elsewhere and shape the substance of the content which is on the internet. Uh, and that is controversial. And it's also extremely challenging because of the way the internet is designed, it is, was designed to be fragmented, um, pluralistic, uh, and difficult to limit information. Uh, and and uh, I think President Clinton had said once that trying to control the internet is like trying to nail jello to the wall. Uh, and I think that is true. And even though the Chinese have a lot of people and organizations focused on that, uh, it is a big challenge for them. And then when they talk internationally about internet sovereignty, they do find some common ground, particularly with other uh, governments that control, want to control information, ones that typically aren't democracies. Uh, but to make that a global norm that uh, governments basically have the right um, from A to Z in any aspect of the internet to control content, uh, shape content, uh, is probably something that they're not going to be successful in, in doing. And they don't even have domestic consensus on that. So to try and do that internationally, I think it's going to be, would be particularly difficult. So as you said, you know, um, it's difficult to really keep that control of information going. And there's been a lot of talk about to what extent that control is really effective at keeping the Chinese people ignorant or easily governed. Do you think that the Great Firewall is really an effective me method of governance for Beijing? You know, China is not North Korea, right? It is, it, there is information, even leaving aside the internet. Chinese people are relatively well educated. They have mm -hmm. knowledge about the world. Uh, your average Chinese person that you meet probably knows more about international affairs in the West than your average American knows about China. Uh, at the same time, I, th I think the purpose of the Great Firewall uh, is, is really twofold. Uh, one, it is there are it's, there's specific ideas or information that the Chinese government doesn't want people to have access to. The other is to simply make it difficult to raise the costs of becoming well informed. So the the firewall does have ways around it. There are VPNs, proxies, other things that people can use to get that in, uh, information. And there was a vigorous debate within China. And, the, and given that you have 640 million Chinese internet users, five plus million internet sites, uh, it is you have to have a very large uh, organization to monitor all of that. So I think to try and shape opinion and just make it more difficult for people uh, to get information that's inconsistent with what the party wants them to see as the basic goals. Um, I think they're relatively successful in that. It, you know, Chinese peoples do have distinctive opinions about various international issues, um, and that is partly shaped by the type of uh, experience they have on the internet. Of course, that comes in combination with what they learn in their classrooms, what they see on TV, what they hear on the radio, what they learn from their families, their parents, uh, other sources of authority. That to, if what they saw on the internet was entirely inconsistent with those other parts of, uh, of news and, and sources, then it wouldn't be effective. But in the combination of those different sources, um, it probably you know, is relatively eff effective, but not completely. You do have diverse opinion in China. So as you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of debate about this control in China. What do you think it would take for the Chinese government to consider loosening any of these controls? There are some reasons why they do want an internet, right? So it's not that they've tried to stop it entirely. Obviously, what is number one in China? Economic growth. What helps economic growth? The development of markets. And the internet is obviously helpful with that. Uh, it also helps get, make people more educated. They become more productive uh, workers as well. Uh, number uh, 1A is to make sure that facilitating economic development via the internet and information sharing doesn't threaten the party's hold on power. Mm -hmm. um, so they are, so the party itself uh, and the leadership uh, is constrained by trying to achieve both goals at the same time. So they, they have to walk some type of balance. Now do, uh, to what extent might they change that balance to ex allow greater information. You know, I think that would be dependent on one, to what extent is economic growth slowing, and to, and to what extent 
if China wants to have more sustainable growth over the long term, they need greater uh, flow of information within the country. Um, and if China is going to avoid the middle income trap, become a more innovative society, uh, develop as a f uh, global financial hub, uh, greater sharing of information is critical for all of those things. Um, one of the reasons Hong Kong is a, a global financial hub is the f access to all types of information in, in, in Hong Kong because markets depend on information. The, the second would be if the party felt more comfortable and secure with its hold on power, loosening access to information wouldn't threaten that. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, they don't feel that way. With uh, new leadership in power, with concern about color revolutions, uh, with uh, instability in different parts of China from their perspective, with concerns about what the United States uh, motives are vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, this is not a uh, with the anti-corruption campaign uh, that they're uh, taking on. This is a, a government which at the moment doesn't feel very secure. Um, and therefore, you know, in the near term, I don't expect that balance between trying to promote growth and expanding access to information and the concerns about maintaining power to actually shift very much. Okay. So moving into the uh, international arena a little bit mm -hmm. more, um, what role would you say the Internet plays in foreign policy for China as well as for the U.S.? You know, China, of course, um, has a, a political system where the party and the government make foreign policy decisions, domestic policy decisions, and uh, they are not directly accountable to voters. Uh, at the same time, they do want to know what people think. Uh, they pay great attention to public opinion and trends in social media and what is going on in China's internet and they can be affected by that. Uh, not because there's uh, direct pressure that would necessarily, that hold them accountable if they made certain decisions or didn't make certain deci uh, other decisions, um, but the Chinese also can sit constantly, you know, put their finger up and try and measure the pulse uh, and, and winds of popular opinion. And so we, we do know that with regard to issues of nationalism, whether it has to do with relations with Japan, cross-strait relations involving Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, any types of territorial issues. Uh, Chinese participants in the internet, which uh, skew towards younger mm -hmm. folks who are relatively nationalistic, uh, use the internet to air their views and grievances. Uh, and the Chinese uh, leadership has to be responsive. They pay, attention, they pay great attention to what the opinion trend lines are. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily force them to take a harder line versus Japan or others on things, but they, but they know generally where the lines of opinion are, and it, they'll need to reshape them if they want to do something different. There's, you know, another uh, way the internet uh, affects uh, public policy and international relations is it does provide for more communication uh, and understanding. And so even though you have that nationalistic element to how public opinion might feed into foreign policy through the internet. Um, Chinese are extremely interested in what's going on in the United States and the West, have many friends, business relationships, cultural links that are sustained by the internet. So, it, so there is a large, quiet majority of Chinese that use the internet to maintain good relations with the West. And that's something that you can just see on a daily basis. So uh, that's a, a, a side of the internet which helps produce greater interdependence between China and the rest of the world, which I think does uh, make China at the policy level understand what the benefits are of uh, interacting with the West in a cooperative way. So on the note of that interdependence, uh, recently, you know, the Chinese government has started cracking down harder on VPNs in China and VPN access. Um, and many small and uh, medium businesses, foreign businesses operating in China are concerned about how this is going to affect their operations. Um, what do you think this means going forward for these smaller groups in China? Um, well, as I said, you know, one of the Chinese uh, leadership's goals with regard to governing the Internet is to raise the costs of getting access to types of information they wouldn't want people to otherwise see. And one of the ways around that has been the use of VPNs, mm -hmm. uh, virtual private networks. Um, software that you install on your computer to make your 
to find a place outside China that acts as your new IP address and then through encrypted data sends that back to your computer. Um, there's various kinds of VPNs. Some have more, uh, some are stronger than others, but the Chinese basically have figured out over time uh, how to degrade VPNs and essentially shut them off. Um, so I think in the short term, that raises the cost for everybody. There are other ways around the firewall to get information, um, but those haven't been as popularized. So it will, uh, so in the very short term, it will be diff more difficult for your average user in China who had found a way to get around the firewall to get that information, but other ways will be developed. Uh, so again, as in, in a game of cat and mouse, you have steps taken by the party and, and internet authorities to can limit access, and then you have new technological developments uh, around those. And so at the moment, what we're seeing is a trending down in terms uh, in the greater control. Uh, Chinese uh, young people are very tech savvy. Uh, folks outside China also develop these types of technologies. So I don't, I would expect within a few months, if not already, you are going to be seeing a gradual popularization of other types of techniques uh, to get around these types of obstacles that are now in place. And then the Chinese government will respond mm -hmm. again. So we will see that uh, continue. So for a multinational corporation op operating in China that has had its operations um, affected by this, do you see a similar recourse for them kind of moving in a more tech savvy uh, direction? What, what should they be doing? You know, large multinationals and banks, they're in a different category mm -hmm. than your average user. And many of them uh, do not depend on operating within the Chinese internet mm -hmm. and within, behind the firewall. They have already installed uh, special lines, some call them T1 lines or other types of technologies, which essentially uh, take a line from their offices and pl plug directly into AT&T or other international service providers uh, outside the firewall. So uh, particularly in the financial community, but any larger multinational company, uh, even some foreign educational institutions that operate in China have installed these. And for them, they're just, they have those in place. Uh, they pay a very high monthly cost for that type of service. Um, and as far as I know, that hasn't been affected. So for those uh, companies and other organizations for governments, um, they already have other ways uh, around the firewall that haven't been threatened uh, that they really need. You just can't operate uh, a company, a global company or, or embassies um, or financial institutions if you can't protect the data within your organization. Uh, and at the, for the moment, uh, the Chinese haven't uh, targeted them, at least in the same way that they're targeting your average user like you or me. So for these larger companies that don't rely on VPNs to operate in China, there can be other considerations that come into play, especially when we start looking at things like search engines, um, like the cases of Google and Yahoo, which show what happened to corporations that play ball, as it were, with Chinese censorship or what happens when they don't. Um, what are the pros and cons of either choice? Sure. Google's uh, a company that decided uh, they weren't going to allow uh, filtering of their search engine. So in order to get around the legal requirement that if they had their servers in China, they'd need to install that and use that type of software, they moved their servers for their China service to Hong Kong. So they didn't violate any rules. They just decided that they were going to operate those servers legally from Hong Kong. Um, the result of that is, is that their business for search in China has fallen. It was around 80% of all searches in China. It's now down to around 2 or 3%. Uh, and Baidu's uh, skyrocketed. Uh, they're well over 60% of all searches now go through Baidu, uh, if not more. You know, that's uh, for a, a company like Google, who is, has global uh, operations. For them, they need to decide uh, what is the marginal benefit to them to expand business in China relative to their global business. And if they made concessions uh, in the way they operate for China, what would that have, what effect would that have on their other business? And I think Google's uh, calculation was that their global business was so important and so large in China, a relatively small portion, particularly at the time, uh, that 
they didn't need to make those concessions, uh, and that eventually maybe things in China would change for them, uh, and that there would be other different kinds of business opportunities. Um, so far, it hasn't worked out that way, but we know Google is doing well as a company, and uh, so it may make sense from global strategy. For other companies in, in the internet space where China is a potential very large market for them uh, and where they're going to put a lot of eggs in their basket, then they will, uh, then so far what they've had to do is, is basically bite the bullet and comply with the Chinese laws and regulations that apply across the internet. Uh, and uh, that puts many of them in a bind uh, when the users of those websites uh, or services uh, also want protections related to their privacy. Uh, so that, that's a, a big challenge for, for Yahoo, which was more in China. They, they eventually divested out of some of the companies that they were operating with in China, for example, with Alibaba. But you see others uh, like uh, LinkedIn, which is trying to do more in China, or Facebook, which isn't in China now, but obviously wants to be. Given the way the Chinese internet is controlled and the high priority that China places on internet sovereignty, or at least be, being able to use that regulatory mechanism uh, in order to give folks a license, that, that's a, a decision that all those companies are going to need to make. And then figure out, well, if they do make those types of compromises in, in their, the way they operate, um, what can they do to reassure users? Obviously, um, you know, leading from that, Chinese companies and websites are benefiting greatly from uh, the reduced competition that stems from the censorship. What do you think would happen to them if China did begin loosening this? You know, uh, I'm sure that uh, those companies that have benefited uh, from this would tell the Chinese government uh, that they would be under grave threat, that mm -hmm. things would uh, be very difficult for them, that their revenues would fall, that their profits would fall, that. Uh, and that China would be much less secure in terms of information and politically. I'm, I'm sure that's part of the daily conversation. I think the reality, though, is, is that the Internet is a, a cultured space. It's a socialized space. And, and, and therefore, websites um, that attract users, whether it, it's through providing information or part of e-commerce, they adapt to the social environments that they're in linguistically, culturally, um, they understand the habits of their users. Um, and that's not something that a new company would just walk in off the street and just immediately take over. So to think that, f that just allowing Facebook in would immediately be a, a huge threat to uh, Ren Ren or any of these other uh, types of social media uh, presupposes that all of these products are interchangeable uh, very quickly. And they're not. And once you start using a product uh, on, in the internet, uh, it, they're pretty sticky. You, you don't just typically just jump from one to another. So I think actually th not all of these Chinese companies would be under threat. And I think some of them are actually pretty good. Uh, Tencent's uh, Weibo, uh, Weixin, uh, uh, Sina's Weibo, those are really pro very good products and services that people use a lot. And I wouldn't expect those to disappear um, or be under threat just because there was more competition. I think it actually ended up making those products better. Uh, you know, as you know, Xi Jinping is scheduled to make an official state visit here uh, later this year. And a few analysts have commented on the possibility uh, that he and President Obama might, in fact, discuss internet in some way, cybersecurity, censorship. Um, going back to my earlier question about the foreign policy, what might be the goal of each leader going into these talks? Um, do you think there's a way for them to meet in the, in the middle on foreign or internet? That, you know, it's, it's an extremely thorny issue. Um, and as, as you know, uh, cybersecurity has is, is been very high on the agenda f uh, for both, both because uh, both governments have large intelligence communities that engage in information collection uh, and surveillance globally, and, and they've also been targets. Uh, the U.S. government agencies, uh, the U.S. military, American companies, um, and also in China as well. So both initiators and, and targets. Uh, so it's very high on the agenda. Uh, and as you know, last year in, uh, uh, in May, uh, the U U.S. Justice Department indicted five Chinese uh, on cyber crimes. Uh, and, and the consequence of that, regardless of the substance of the, uh, the quality of the indictments, was to put uh, the cyber dialogue uh, between the two governments on hold. The Chinese were, were extremely upset about that. Of course, there are still conversations between the two governments. There are also track two dialogues uh, as well. 
You know, I think for, for the United States, what their goal is, is to try and separate the different parts of the discussion uh, into different baskets. There is, obviously, issues related to cybersecurity, uh, what governments do, intelligence, um, and cybercrime. Those are certain topics that need to be discussed. But in addition to that, separately, I th believe that what the U.S. government is hoping for are conversations related to market access to uh, on internet uh, related issues. So that includes both access for uh, content providers, service providers, as well as uh, information and telecommunications companies that sell equipment uh, globally uh, in China uh, that are also facing problems of market access in China. The Chinese recently uh, promulgated regulations saying that over the next few years uh, the banking industry must use information and telecommunications technologies which are secure. And that, what that means really is localized products which would leave uh, many American IT firms, telecom firms out of the Chinese market uh, if uh, those rules were implemented in a way that were discriminatory which is what most people think the motives is. Um, so uh, the dialogue between both sides needs to figure, there needs to be a way to have a conversation about both types of things. I'd say, just to wrap up on this point, there are some global norms about the internet, but not a lot. Um, and we are in early days of developing those norms, both on the government side, uh, as well as commercial side, uh, all aspects of governance of the internet. And I, for me, this looks like the early days of the 1960s when the United States and the Soviets were trying to develop norms around nuclear weapons and arms control. Uh, and the development of, you know, how would we, you know, first use, second use, uh, all of these uh, norms which developed, uh, it was easier then. E even though you would think of, of nuclear weapons as, as, as more dangerous. Um, and that's because you had relatively small communities in two countries, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, that interacted with each other um, and could develop those norms over 20, 30 years, even, even now. The internet is different. The internet has billions of users in countries all over the world, different regulations in every country, different types of websites, w ideas about information, um, about what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. Um, you and I are participants in that global governance discussion. So to develop consensus on internet governance on all these issues is way harder than on arms, nuclear arms control. So I think we're still in early days. I would hope that uh, in the summit uh, when, when uh, Xi Jinping visits, they will find ways to talk about discrete elements of this and then gradually grope towards talking about bigger issues. But we are, not gonna, we are very far from having a universal idea about what is right and wrong, what is fair and unfair, what's appropriate and inappropriate. And, in, and before we do that, there's still some specific things that hopefully that they'll be able to uh, uh, discuss and maybe make some progress on. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, but I'd like to thank Dr. Kennedy for joining us and to all of you at home. See you next time on China Forum. <laughs>